Hey, I hope you're having a great week. Um, I want to just give you this short video explaining and going into the construction of the Bible. Now, I've posted a few other videos, and I hope you've enjoyed those. Though it's uh, videos by the Bible Project, and the Bible Project does a very good job of of showing an illustration and, and making a lot of information very digestible. Uh, but I want to go just a little bit further and help you understand how the Bible is constructed. And, and this week, I hope you've began to to understand the Bible more because the Bible is very important. Because in the Christian faith, the Bible is how we understand who God is, who Jesus is, who the Holy Spirit is what the church's purpose um, and what the church even is, what the history of God and humanity is, how we're supposed to live and how we're supposed to act and how we're supposed to relate to God and relate to people. And so the Bible is the primary source that gives us all of this information. And so it's really important that we understand how the Bible is set up, how the Bible is constructed and how it's written. And uh, so I want to go a little bit further today in talking about uh, the construction of the Bible. So now most Bibles are broken into 66 books. Uh, just about every Bible you pick up is is written uh, and you can count them and there are 66 books. Now the Catholic and the Greek Orthodox Bibles uh, many times will contain 14 or 15 other books in the Old Testament. Now these other books are known as the Apocrypha, or sometimes in one of the videos it talked about these books. It called them the Second Temple Writings. And so if you can remember that, it gives a little bit more detail in those other books. But some, um, if, you, if you're Catholic or you're Greek Orthodox, you might have a few more books in the Old Testament. While Protestant, and Protestant simply means uh, churches that are not Catholic or Greek, we will kind of get into why we have Protestant churches versus Catholic and Greek Orthodox. We'll get into that when we talk about some church history. But for now, you know that most Bibles have 66 books. And the simple reason to the discrepancy here is that Protestant churches use the Hebrew Scriptures, the Jewish Old Testament. The Jewish Bible is, is made up of the Old Testament, and they use exactly what's in there, while the... Other churches, uh, while Catholic and Greek Orthodox, they use these 14 or 15 that were definitely used um, in history, and they were even included in, in Greek translations of the Old Testament, but they're not in all of them. Regardless, what we're going to gonna hold on to today is that there are 66 books in the Bible. Now, out of these 66 books, there are two Testaments. I already mentioned the Old Testament, but you have the first part, the Old Testament and the New Testament writings. We will start first with the Old Testament. The Old Testament consists of 39 books written from roughly 1450 BC to 430 BC, so a very, very long time ago, and it was written by a whole bunch of different authors. The Old Testament, like I was saying before, is the Jewish scriptures. It is the Jewish Bible. If you don't know this or you haven't had much familiarity with Christianity, Christianity and the Jewish religion, they share uh, common roots. They come from the same place. But where Christianity begins to make its own thing is with the man named Jesus, who actually was a Jew himself. Jesus was raised Jewish he was raised following the Jewish religion and um, following the laws and the customs of the Jewish religion. But then Jesus claimed to be the Son of God. He claimed and fulfilled prophecies and did these amazing teachings. And then he was crucified and raised from the dead. And Jesus' followers went on and began to start the church. And that's where kind of Christianity diverges from the Jewish religion. After Jesus has died... Um, and raised again, and it's what we believe in the Christian faith. After that, his followers go on to start the Christian religion. Now, Jews still hold the Old Testament as sacred and true, but most Jews today are still waiting on the Messiah, the Savior of the world to come. But Christians believe that man that came, uh, that Savior, was Jesus himself. So that's kind of where the two diverge. But this Old Testament, Jews hold, but also Christians hold too. So let's go back to the Old Testament. How is it constructed? The first five books, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, they are known as the Torah, or sometimes they're known as the Pentateuch. Penta meaning five, 
five books, Torah, Pentateuch, or sometimes you'll even hear it referred to as the law. These are the first five books of the Old Testament. Now, these books provide a foundation for creation, God's relationship with humanity, and the beginning of the people of God, which are known as the Israelites, the Hebrew people, the, the Jewish people. They begin as the Israelites, and they begin as God's chosen people. Now, the purpose of these chosen people, the purpose of the Israelites was to look different than the world around them. God chose them so he could reveal himself to the world and ultimately, through Jesus Christ, redeem the entire world. But it started with this single group, uh, this, this single people group, the Israelites. And for the Israelites to look different than the world around them, God gave them a standard to live by. He gave them the law. And that law, these commandments, are in the first five books of the Old Testament. And this is where you find the Ten Commandments. You know, do not kill, do not steal, do not lie. You know, the Ten Commandments, this is where you find those. And then, as well as those ten, you also find 600 more commands that God gives to the Israelites to say, hey, you need to live to this standard so you look different than the world around you. This first five books just creates this foundation and creates the foundation of the law and who these Israelite people are. Now, you after you move from these five books, you go into the next 12 books of the Old Testament, Joshua, Judges, Ruth, 1st and 2nd Samuel, 1st and 2nd Kings, 1st and 2nd Chronicles, Ezra, Nehemiah, and Esther. And these books help record the history of Israel, the history of these Jewish people, the history of the Hebrews. And you don't have to read very far in, in these books to realize that the Israelites are not very good at living up to the standard God gave them. So he gave them the law, and then you read pretty quick in their history, they fail time and time and time again of trying to live to the standard. Many times they look like the, the world living around them. But what gets me time and time again is that even in spite of this, even though this is the Israelites fail and come up short to the standard, God doesn't give up on them. He could have given up on them, but he doesn't. He still continues to be with them. After Esther, after the book of Esther, you then have six wisdom and poetry books, which include Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon, and then you have to skip two books, and then you have the book of Lamentations. So that's your six books there. These books contain poetry, they contain songs, and they contain ancient Jewish like wise sayings. It's literally wisdom books. You read it and it'll give you um, different wisdom and different ways to live. And there's a lot of poetry and just beautiful writing in these six books. And so they're, they're kind of in the middle. And then the last part of the Old Testament includes the prophet books. And there's a bunch here. They, they include Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi. Whew, I know it's a lot, but these are the prophet books. Uh, these are books that were written by prophets of God or people of God, which God directly spoke to. And that these prophets many times were called to rebuke and call out the sin or the wrongdoings of the Israelite people um, and, and done throughout their history. And, and many times when you're reading these books, these books, these prophets correspond directly to different times in Jewish history that you can read about in the historical books of the Old Testament. And so the, the, some of the Old Testament goes in chronological order, but then you get to like the prophets, and the prophets, those writings really um, don't come after the historical books chronologically. Instead, those books are kind of interwoven throughout history if that kind of makes sense. And so that is just a very quick overview of how the Old Testament is lined up. You have the five Torah, the, the foundation, the, the Pentateuch, the law, the commandments. And then you have um, the history books. 
that tell the history of the Israelite people. You have the wisdom and the poetry books, and then finally you have the instructions and the rebuke and um, the, the writings of the prophets. And so that makes up the Old Testament. Now let's move to the New Testament. The New Testament has 27 books. It's much shorter, um, and it's a, it's a lot it's, it's usually less confusing than the Old Testament, but the New Testament has 27 books written from roughly 50 AD, so anywhere from 15, 20 years after Jesus to the early 100s AD, so anywhere from 20 to 70 or 80 years after Jesus um, died. Um, but these 27 books are broken up into different sections as well. The first four, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, are typically known as the Gospels. And gospel is one of your key terms. And so if you're watching this, you might want to write this down. Gospel simply means good news. Gospel simply means good news. And so these four books are the good news of Jesus. And remember that I told you that God was using the Israelites to ultimately bring about redemption to the entire world. Well, this is going to be accomplished through this Jewish man named Jesus. And we will get into Jesus' story next week. But what you need to know here about the, the organization and the construction of the Bible is that these gospel books tell about Jesus' life, his death, and his resurrection. And um, if you haven't noticed yet, this semester you'll be reading through the book of John. And so if you've never read it, it's a, it's a great one. I will tell you, reading John, John is not written chronologically. It, uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke are. They're written chronologically to kind of walk you through Jesus' life. But John is written in a, a different format. And he even says at the very end of his book that his purpose is so that when people read this, that they believe. And so uh, John has a very specific way of writing. And you will see that as you continue to read. But you will read through John. These four books, though, are known as the Gospels. Next, you have the book of Acts. And Acts is a historical book which details the history of the church. So after Jesus' death and his resurrection, he ascends back into heaven. And he is seated with God the Father. After that, the Holy Spirit, and we'll get into this more, so this is just some, some basic. The Holy Spirit comes and the church begins. Christianity begins. And the his, uh, this book of Acts goes through and records the history from Jesus' departure to um, throughout the, the start of the, the early church. And it is a history that will lead you from uh, beginning to to a few years down down the road, maybe 20 years down the road even, of the church. So that's the book of Acts. Next, you have 21 books that are written as epistles. Epistle, again, is one of your key terms. So if you're watching this, epistle means letter. Epistle means letter. So these 21 books are written as letters. Um, like you might write a letter to your grandma or you might have a pen pal that you write a letter to. These books were written as letters, and these letters were intended to help instruct the church or church leaders. So you have Romans, 1st and 2nd Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, 1st and 2nd Timothy, Titus, Philemon, Hebrews, James, 1st and 2nd Peter, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, and Jude. And all these are set up with an author writing to an audience and writing them a letter. Finally, you have the last book of the Bible. You have Revelation, which is a writing of the end times. And Revelation might be the most confusing book in the Bible, but it closes the Bible with evil being destroyed. So the Bible in its whole, the Bible in Genesis opens where there, where sin enters the world. Evil enters the world. But in Revelation, evil is destroyed. Genesis, the world is corrupted by evil and sin. And death is present. But in Revelation, there is a creation of a new heaven and a new earth. And life is given. And so there is this contrast from the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible. And all the pages in between Genesis and Revelation begin to tell the story of God and his redemption of humanity. 
And so that is just a quick overview of the construction of the Bible. So I hope it helps you understand a little bit when you go to read it. The last thing I want to address before I get off of here is when was the Bible completely put together? So in the late 300s, at the Council of Hippo Regis, I think is how you say it, Hippo, Hip, Hippo, Hippo Regis, I think is how you say it. In the late 300s, there was a Council of Hippo Regis and a Council of Carthage, and it was at these two councils that they officially recognized the 27 books of the New Testament. Now, the Old Testament, like I said earlier, was already the Jewish scripture. So it was held as scripture from um, very early, early on that people could recognize that this is scripture because that was the Jewish scripture. Now, the New Testament, though, this were written after Jesus was alive. These 27 books weren't officially recognized until the late 300s. Now, you might be sitting there and saying, well, if they weren't recognized till the late 300s, that's a couple hundred years after Jesus was alive. How can we take these to be truth? And I think it is a fair question, but what you have to realize is that prior to this time, these writings were already viewed as authoritative. So as soon as these writings were written from Paul and from Peter and from John, they were passed around and written down and, and passed uh, throughout the churches and they were viewed as authoritative. They were viewed as scripture. Now, during this time after, you know, between um, Jesus's departure and 300, where the 27 books were um, officially recognized. Now, there were some other books that floated around. There were some books that were ultimately discredited. There were some books that were debated and some that were even used. But in the 300s, there, it was the first time that Christianity became legal. And when Christianity became legal, people began to be able to talk about and discuss and research the books that were being used. And so the point I want to make here is that at these councils and, and before this time, there wasn't this like loosey-goosey, well, what book should be scripture? It wasn't like that. Um, it, by the time it got to the 300s, there were already these set books that were viewed as scripture, that were viewed as authoritative. And then in the 300s, what they did is they really tried to figure out and they traced back which of these books have apostolic authorship. And apostolic authorship simply meant who of these authors can we verify were with Jesus? Or maybe somebody that wrote for one of his disciples. So maybe somebody that wrote for Peter. Who can we make sure that the if we're going to make these scripture, if we're going to recognize them as scripture, then they need to be directly tied to Jesus and the people that walked with him. So in the 300s, they finally made it official, even though it, it was already official in many aspects. But they, they recognized them officially, the 27 books um, in the 300s. I hope that makes sense. I could go in a lot more detail and and it, it's a lot of, a lot of thought there and you can do a lot of research um, on the putting together of the Bible if that interests you or you have questions but ultimately what I hope you understand is is that you have a better understanding of scripture how it's divided and how it is telling this one big story of the love of God and his love for humanity and how he is trying to redeem redeem us from our emptiness from the, the things inside of us that, that really pull us down and tear us down and leave us feeling as though we have like death inside of us. Jesus and, and God, they, the, the intention, I think, of the Bible is to bring life to people. So I hope you have a good week. See ya.